The object of Bible prophecy is to make us have more confidence in God and his word. It is not for us to focus on institutions. God highlights these systems so that we are aware of what's going on so that we are without excuse. Since I was a teen, I've been studying the papacy. And I believe what God said, but I was like, how on earth is the whole world going to wander after the beast? Now I'm seeing everything take place. And the system which the Bible calls Jezebel, the little horn, the Antichrist, the man of sin, and the whore of Babylon is now gathering speed and momentum and the whole world is gradually, slowly gearing towards worshipping that papal beast. He is, I think, the, the strongest moral voice in the world today. And I think he is uh, a figure who's changing the international debate uh, more powerfully, I think, than I've seen uh, any individual do in many, many any years. Any religious leader? Well, any religious leader, any uh, leader mm -hmm. beyond that. So Look, what he's, impact on climate change? I think what he's saying right now, why he convened mayors and other leaders from around the world, is we have to race towards the Paris summit in December. If you look at the encyclical that the Pope published, it is urgent. It is filled with a, a sense that we must act literally now if we're going to reverse the situation our planet is facing. In this mayor, among many other political figures around the world, has taken a directive from the Pope. But unfortunately, they do not see the wider picture. 25 years ago, that is a quarter of a century, one year after the fall of the Berlin Wall, a Catholic priest, the late Malachi Martin, published a book in the year 1990, which basically laid out the papacy's plan for world domination. It was titled The Keys of This Blood. Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for control of the new world order, where it not only asks some key questions, but it also makes some very strong statements. Who will establish the first one world system of government that has ever existed in the society of nations? Who will hold and wield the dual power of authority and control over each one of us as individuals and over all of us together as a community. The competition is all out because now that it has started, there is no way it can be reversed or called off. No one can be exempted from its effects. No sector of our lives will remain untouched. As to the time factor involved, those of us who are under 70 will see at least the basic structures of the new world government installed. Those of us under 40 will surely live under its legislative, executive and judiciary authority and control. What captures the unwavering attention of the secular leaders of the world in this remarkable network of the Roman Catholic Church is precisely the fact that it places at the personal disposal of the Pope a supranational, supercontinental, super trade block structure that is so built and oriented that if tomorrow or next week by a sudden miracle a one world government were established the church would not have to undergo any essential structural change in order to retain its dominant position and to further its global aims so what are its global aims it says that men have no reliable hope of creating a viable geopolitical system or a one world government unless it is on the basis of Roman Catholic Christianity. So the Vatican has openly declared her one ultimate objective to have the entire world at the seat of her feet. But how would she achieve that? By cleverly influencing world leaders to follow her lead on social issues. Monsignor Marcelo Sorando is an Argentine Catholic Bishop and the current Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. He organized a workshop from the 2nd to the 6th of May 2014 and it included some of the top scientists in the world many of them who are members of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences who, though secular scientists, are using Catholic social teaching such as the common good to interpret how to make the world a better place. 
Costa Rican diplomat Cristiana Figueres, who was appointed Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change on May 7, 2010, a day after the Vatican seminar, wrote in the London Guardian that faith leaders need to find their voice on climate change. She said it is time for faith groups and religious institutions to find their voice and set their moral compass on one of the great humanitarian issues of our time. A couple of days later, on May the 9th, 2014, representatives from the United Nations went to the Vatican to hear Pope Francis I give them a speech on helping the injustices of the needs of the poor peoples of this planet. Cristiano Figueres tweeted that the United Nations and the Vatican should make people even more aware of climate change. To lay the groundwork for Pope Francis I's visit in September 2015, he had to condition the most influential minds and lay the groundwork first. So the head of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, again, hosted another workshop in April 2015 titled Protect the Earth, Dignify Humanity. And in attendance were some of the most influential politicians, economists, scientists and members of the world's religions who embrace the Pope's new world environmental order. One month later, in May 2015, the Pope's encyclical Lodato Si was published. News channels were in on the hype, which gave the papacy more prestige. Orthodox bishops went to the Vatican and followed its lead. It was embraced by the faculty of Yale University in the United States. But what does it actually teach? It was the most successful way of introducing Catholic social teaching to the masses. Listen to the language very carefully. Section 1 says, Lodeto si, mi senor. Praise be to you, my lord. In the words of this beautiful canticle, Saint Francis of Assisi reminds us that our common home is like a sister with whom we share our life and beautiful and the words highlighted in red, mother, who opens her arms to embrace us. Praise be to you, my lord, through our sister, mother earth, who sustains and governs us and who produces various fruit with colored flowers and herbs. Why is mother used? This is a slick way of coercing gay worshipping environmentalists into drinking the ideological wine of papal Babylon. For further on in the letter, we see who mother is in section 241. Mary, the mother who cared for Jesus, now cares with natural affection and pain for this wounded world. Carried up into heaven, which is unscriptural, she is the mother and queen of all creation. When you read the Catechism of the Catholic Church from the Vatican website, it reads in section 169 that salvation comes from God alone. But because we receive the life of the faith through the church, she is our mother. We believe the church is the mother of our new birth and not in the church as if she were the author of salvation. Because she is our mother, she is also our teacher in the faith. Goodbye, Holy Spirit. In section 181, it reads, The church is the mother of of all believers. No one can have God as father who does not have the church as mother. Didn't Jesus in John chapter 14 and verse 6 say, I am the way, the truth and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me? Obviously Rome does not think so, but Catholic social teaching is having a stronger influence than you think. Naomi Klein is a famous social activist and a strong critic of social injustices. She was invited to the Vatican in June 2015 to discuss climate change. And once the Vatican can get the most influential figures to embrace her, she will be unstoppable. The following month in July 2015, 
60 mayors were invited from all over the world to discuss climate change at the Vatican. And all the mayors said that they will do exactly what the Pope says. Jerry Brown, the 39th governor of California, embraced it. Mayor de Blasio, already shown, the governor of New York, embraced it. And even a couple of months earlier, Senate leader Kevin De Leon in the United States embraced Pope Francis I's views on climate change. A couple of weeks later, in the beginning of August 2015, President Obama imposed stringent emissions cuts on the power sector in line with the Pope's encyclical on climate change. And the August edition of National Geographic magazine has the Pope on its front cover. So the Vatican skillfully laid the groundwork so that when the Pope arrives in the United States, the ground is ripe for him to tell them anything. Politically, his visit is a powder cake. And I, I think that moving into this trip, a lot of people have expectations that he's going to reinforce uh, this or that particular ideological position. Uh, actually, I think that they should all be very nervous because he offers a worldview that really doesn't fit into American political categories. Uh, and this is, this is going to be quite confounding, I think, for a lot of mainstream American politicians. But how will those be viewed who oppose his visit? The London Guardian noted the history of anti-Catholicism in America, not really given a reason why. And at the end of the article it reads that if some religious fanatics greet Francis with posters calling him the Antichrist and Babylon's whore, they will be on the fringe of the fringe, or you could say domestic terrorists. Because secular minds cannot decipher spiritual eternal concepts in the Holy Scriptures, they attack what they do not understand. When identifying the last power on earth, the book of Revelation says, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5. In ancient Babylon, the king wore the mitre with the tassels going down to his back and had a golden cup in their hand. And in papal Babylon, the popes have also been attired with the same mitre, also with a golden cup in their hand. In ancient Babylon, the crescent moon inside the sun represented the celestial worship of the heavenly bodies, where they worshipped the creature more than the creator. And that system of pagan idolatry has been transferred to papal Babylon, where the monstrance used in mass has the crescent moon that will hold the wafer representing not Jesus Christ, but the sun god. Calling Papal Rome Babylon is not new at all. William Tyndale, the 16th century English reformer, who translated most of the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into English, identified the papacy as Mystery Babylon. He said that the great idol, the whore of Babylon, Antichrist of Rome, whom they call the Pope. The following century, Thomas Goodwin, president of Magdalene College of the University of Oxford, is clear that this view preceded Tyndale by many centuries. He said that in the same chapter, that is 17, you find this Romanum Ecclesium S. Mereticum Babylonicum that the Church of Rome was the whore of Babylon, which thing the professors in those next ages did inculcate and insist on and made the eminent article of their profession and confession. By this was especially done by Wycliffe and his followers beginning about the year 1371 in England and after him by John Huss and Jerome of Prague and their followers anno 1400. In the following century, Thomas Newton, who was the Bishop of Bristol, carried the torch and verified this clear biblical Protestant position. 
A woman sitting upon a beast is a lively and significant emblem of a church or city directing and governing an empire. The woman is arrayed or clothed too, verse 4, in purple and scarlet color, this being the color of the popes and cardinals. In the following century, Dr. Henry Grattan Guinness, missionary, preacher, author and prophetic scholar, continues in this historicist school of prophetic interpretation. He said that the view that Babylon meant the Church of Rome was held long before the Reformation and may be said to some extent to have produced it. The Babylonian harlot is represented as enthroned upon many waters which are nations and peoples. She is not only a church but a church ruling nations, that is she claims a temporal as well as a spiritual sway. She governs the beast and his ten horns and so unites a civil and a religious supremacy. Now this is one of the most striking characteristics of the Church of Rome and of that church only. Now who revealed this light to these intellectual English prophetic scholars? I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So the object of prophecy is not only to guide God's people through time and throughout the ages and identify the obstacles they would face, but more so than ever that the character, and I have to stress it, the character of Jesus Christ is developed in their lives and that there is more confidence in Jesus and his word for those professed doubt. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed to it, for it is a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, and when it is embraced and acted upon and studied, the day star, who is Jesus Christ, the bright and morning star, will arise or manifest in your hearts or in your everyday life. So when we see the papacy, the whore of Babylon, while the world scratches their head on how a geopolitical religious power can have such a global sway on secular leaders all over the planet, those who study the two kingdoms still may be a little shocked themselves, but have confidence in God's word that he foretold us of these things to guide God's people into eternity. So as this study comes to a close, let us analyse what the papacy's end game is. The world has been sucked into the vortex of papal hype. Pope Francis I is seen as this global megastar, but so was the late Pope John Paul II. He was also viewed as a global celebrity. And what people think are new policies by Pope Francis, if a little more background research is done, they would know that he has only continued where his predecessors have left off. In this book, The Keys of This Blood, you will clearly see that what many view as a new has been mapped out a quarter of a century ago. Already known for its long cooperation with the policies of Antonio Gramsci, the Pontifical Commission for Justice and Peace, in each of its local branches throughout the 4,000 dioceses of John Paul II's Roman Catholic Church, and observe this language very carefully, consistently endorses the main themes of, listen, Soviet Marxist policy, the evils of capitalism in Western democracies, the call for a unilateral disarmament by the Western powers, the absolute need to establish a one world economic system based on the distribution of the riches, goods and services of the capitalist world. 
This statement was 25 years ago by a Catholic priest. Let us see the movements of the current Pope. In Highgate Cemetery in North London in England are the buried remains of Karl Marx. And the very ideology that the papacy spent the Cold War fighting, Marx's communism, was now embraced by Rome and Antonio Gramsci, an Italian Marxist, was to be the basis of the new satanically skillfully driven deceptive papal policy. The Pope is asking for a redistribution of the world's wealth in line with Gramsci's Marxism, just as the Keys of this Blood has said. But has any journalist, politician or religious leader asked the Pope will he distribute his own wealth? The Economist magazine says that the Catholic Church is as big as any company in America. Time magazine says the Vatican has a big investment in banking, insurance, chemicals, steel construction and real estate. A British director plans to do a film of the Vatican's deep connections with the Mafia, which is probably its connections also to its narcotics money. The Vatican is very secretive about its economic holdings and only through pressure has it released its financial report. She is rich, beyond rich, 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 rich. Avro Manhattan, when researching the Vatican's wealth, documented that a Vatican official who, when asked to make a guess at the Vatican's wealth today, replied very tellingly, only God knows. Who controls this wealth that Revelation chapter 17 verse 4 and chapter 18 verse 3 foretold us about? According to the Roman Catholic canon law, it reads that the Roman pontiff by virtue of governance is the supreme administrator and steward of all ecclesiastical goods. Not the best person in the world to tell the planet to distribute wealth when you had the richest corporation on the entire planet. The Pope, as the keys of this blood says, slams the arms trade. It is true that the arms trade grows from strength to strength because war is a business. Lockheed Martin is to buy Sikorsky, maker of the Black Hawk helicopters, from rival United Technologies for $9 billion, that is £5.8 billion, consolidating its position as the Pentagon's largest supplier. Since Iran has made a deal with the United States about nuclear weapons, international aviation companies, among them Boeing and Airbus, are likely to seek the Iranian government. BAE Systems, though British, is one of the largest arms or defence contractors in the world, who is one of the six largest suppliers to the United States Department of Defence. But who buys stocks in this company? According to the BBC, a Catholic bank in Germany invested 580,000 euros in BAE systems. Pope Francis I is pushing for a new world economic order and pushing for a global government, which the keys of this blood is unequivocally clear that she wants to be the only one who should control it. But for those who do a bit of research, you would see that Pope Francis I continues from his predecessors. There is nothing new about Pope Francis I's pontificate. Like Obama, he just does it with a smile while your freedoms are being chipped away each and every day. What is interesting is that the Vatican doesn't really hide what she planned to do. But what exactly is a new world order? And what does it entail? If someone was to ask you, what would be your response? The principles of the world order that existed before 9-11 is the government of the people by the people and for the people. In other words, the right to privacy, freedom of speech and freedom of the press, freedom of religion 
and trial by jury, etc. And this phrase was adopted from the Reformation in the introduction of the John Wycliffe Bible of the 14th century, which read that this Bible is the government of the people, for the people, and by the people. In a book titled Roman Civil Liberty, James Aiken Wiley shows us what has given us our current world order. In 1380, Wycliffe published his translation of the Bible. The Reformation came preaching the true just divinum when it taught the right of society to govern itself according to those eternal principles of justice, equity and order which God has graven on the natural conscience. God alone, said the reformers, is Lord of the conscience. That was the truth that made Europe free. But the Pope, in his meeting with the current president of Italy, Sergio Mattarella, thinks otherwise. According to the website of the Vatican Radio, Pope Francis I said, religion should not be confined to personal conscience. So to have a new world order, you have to destroy all the freedoms that has been handed down from the Protestant Reformation based upon the Bible. And this is the only way Mystery Babylon, the papacy, can reign supreme. If you really want to know about the papacy, then you have to study the Bible. Not for head knowledge to debate and bash people over the head with, but for spiritual education and to share with others that there is a God in heaven who has not abandoned his creation, but wants to commune with us throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. I know it can be very depressing when you see the madness taking place in this world, but prophecy said Christ is coming back. As a policy of even at the doors, please research every Bible text and every other document for yourselves in this study. As I've been telling people for years, if you do not have a desire for God and His Word, this information just go over your head, it will be irrelevant to you. But the more you desire to be like Him, when you observe these things, the object of prophecy is to really strengthen your walk with God. As you continue these studies, I really hope and pray that people are searching their own hearts to see where they are at spiritually so that they can get a closer walk with Christ so they're not caught off guard when the final events take place on this earth.